We at CleanTech San Diego, Shannon Bresnahan is here with me. Um, are really excited to be part of this event um, here in San Francisco. Um, and so excited that you all joined us here today to hear our San Diego story. Um, obviously an exciting time for California. Um, and thanks to the leadership of our governor and others, uh, once again, we are proving in this state that sustainability and economic prosperity aren't mutually exclusive. After all, it's a very highly regulated state uh, and we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Cleantech San Diego was actually founded 11 years ago by visionary leaders from public, private, and academic sectors who recognized the growing cleantech industry is the next, gener next great economic opportunity for our region. They were guided by the premise that sustainable business practices are viable only if they make financial sense. Directed by this principle, we have seen the San Diego region prove time and again that investment in low carbon economy reaps benefits for the innovation, business, education, and obviously the environment. Today, we in San Diego rank, rank number four in the nation for our clean tech leadership and number two in the nation for solar installations. We are home to one of the world's largest battery storage projects. Our local utility gets 43% of their energy from renewable energy sources. We employ about 40,000 people in the clean tech sector, and almost half of those people are in the solar industry. All in all, the industry has a $6.8 billion impact on our regional economy. But probably most important, uh, we're home to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, and it's world-renowned climate scientist. Uh, in San Diego, we actually, we don't challenge science, we don't debate the merits of facts, but instead we work as a region to address the issues associated with climate change. And that's what brings us here today. But before we get started, uh, I want to recognize and introduce Laura Zagar, a partner at Perkins, and Cooey, Perkins Cooey, who is our host today. Um, as part of her practice, Laura works with clients on the development of innovative renewable energy and infrastructure projects in the western United States and Hawaii. Uh, she also advises emerging clean tech companies on regulatory compliance for technologies new to the market. Laura likes to build big stuff. Um, she's a former San Diegan. Uh, she's now a Berkeleyite. We don't hold that against her. Uh, she's actually on the board of Cleantech San Diego and is a vocal champion for the continued development of renewable energy resources in California and beyond. Laura. Thank you all the Perkins Cooey. We're really um, honored to uh, be a part of um, Cleantech San Diego. We're um, a member and active participant down in San Diego and it's really lovely to see. I still feel a, a part of my heart still in San Diego so it's wonderful to see so many friendly faces up here. Um, Perkins Cooey um, our, one of our founding clients was, um, was a, a utility called Puget Sound Energy, and we took this company called Boeing Public. Um, so <laughs> we have been part of the clean tech evolution for, from before it was even called that. Um, we represent um, everything from com microturbine companies up to um, companies trying to put 12 gigawatt turbines in the ocean and offshore wind, both here in California and Hawaii and throughout the world, actually. So. We do everything in between. We're helping with biofuels um, in the airline industry. Um, we're helping. We have a really top-notch intellectual property group that takes clean tech innovations and, and, and gets the, the patent protections and helps bring them to commercialization. We help with the funding with that. So this is a core practice area for our firm, so we're really thrilled to host Clean Tech San Diego during the climate um, summit uh, here in San Francisco. And I hope that was coherent, because I'm on a lot of cold medicine right now. <laughs> uh, but with that, I'll turn it back to Jason and welcome. And I hope you enjoy our space, and we're happy to host you guys in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give a little background. Uh, founded in 1903, uh, you probably all know this, but Scripps is the global leader in understanding and protecting the planet. In its 115th year history of ocean, earth, and climate research, it's a foundational part of San Diego's identity uh, and a sustainability-minded science innovation town. It was Scripps scientists that first sounded the alarm over half a century ago about climate change uh, and how that could affect every aspect of our life. Uh, today, Scripps continues to be the world leader in climate research, uh, and we in the San Diego region are fortunate to have access to the global scientific leadership right in our own backyard. Uh, the editor of a newspaper recently wrote an opinion piece saying that San Diego has a unique perspective on climate change because we're familiar with the scientists who measure and explain it and have personal experience with its effects. Scripps may be a world-renowned climate science institution, but they're really a part of our local community. 
They open their doors to business collaborators and help, and help inform climate change policy discussions. In fact, they were a key component or a key partner uh, in the founding of Clean Tech San Diego back in 2007. So it's a partnership that we carry with great pride, um, and because of it, we feel privileged to be in a position to help strengthen the business or the connection between climate science uh, and the business community. So with that, um, we're really, really honored to have with us today the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, doc Dr. Margaret Leinen, uh, who will open our program with a talk about the science of our climate challenge and the role Scripps is playing in bringing climate ch science to climate action, uh, both regionally and globally. You can probably all imagine that Margaret's been pretty tapped here in, in San Francisco this week uh, with her role at Scripps, uh, so we're really honored to have her here this morning to share with you some of the, the latest. So, Margaret, welcome. Thanks for joining us. You heard that we're 115 years old. For most of that time, we have been privileged to have with us uh, <laughs> Professor Walter Monk, who has joined us. Uh, he is celebrating his 101st birthday next month. And <laughs> lest you think that he's just sitting back and enjoying it being 101, he has an active grant from the Office of Naval Research and is still doing fundamental research uh, to assist us. Uh, but he has been, uh, uh, his sense of understanding the ocean, not just as the ocean, but in all of its connections to the atmosphere, the land, uh, to climate, to the rest of environment, have really been uh, an inspiration to all of, of Scripps. And I think that a lot of our very broad look at things uh, derives from the, the philosophy and the, the model of this remarkable man who I have the pleasure of seeing so often at, at Scripps. Uh, so uh, just a couple words about that history. Um, the, the person in the picture is Roger Revelle, who was a former director of, of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And in 1957, he published uh, a remarkable paper which sort of defined the fact that the ocean was not taking up all of the CO2. Before that, we thought that the ocean was taking up all of the CO2, and therefore that CO2 emissions would not be a climate problem. He documented that that was not the case, and then said as a result of that, something that is uh, uh, that, that uh, has been quoted many times, that human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past, nor be reproduced in the future. So just like a scientist to call it an experiment, uh, so we're all dealing with the impacts of that unintended experiment. Uh, in order to document uh, exactly how that worked, uh, he, he made uh, several hires that were very important. On the left-hand side uh, is Charles David Keeling, who went out and exquisitely measured the CO2 in the atmosphere. So that sawtooth curve that you see all of the time with the CO2 in the atmosphere was derived from uh, Dave Keeling's work. Uh, the first measurements were made off of the Scripps Pier in 1956. Uh, and then uh, in 1957 established the station on Mauna Loa. The man in the middle was not an experimentalist. He was a theoretician and a modeler, and that's Jerome Demias. He was the first person who modeled the atmosphere and the ocean together, and he talked about the impact of the ocean on weather. And his models were the very first global climate models. Uh, and the whole history of what we use today to try to tell you what we anticipate for the future is on the shoulders of that remarkable person. And then in the right-hand panel is Ramanathan, who won the climate and uh, uh, Clean Air Coalition uh, Hero Award uh, month, uh, Tuesday night, um, and he is the person who t showed us that the short-lived species like methane, black carbon, and HFCs 
are responsible for about 25% of the warming, and they're also uh, potent pollutants. So as we think about this climate and clean tech space, being able to address those issues, as well as the CO2 and energy efficiency issue, uh, is extraordinarily important for how we're going to address this topic. So just to give you a sense of, uh, I think those are the shoulders that all of us stand on at, at Scripps. So uh, we are moving now from detecting and documenting climate change to understanding its impacts and how to adapt to it. So that's really a hallmark of, of uh, Scripps today and how science informs policymakers. So we have joint appointments with the Global School, uh, the School of Global uh, Policy and Strategy, with economics, with other parts of the university to make sure that our science does move directly into action. Uh, a, an example of that is the California Fourth Climate Change Assessment, uh, which just came out. Uh, this, what we did at Scripps was to develop a way of downscaling those global climate models to the local level. And when I say local, uh, in science terms, it's six kilometers, so you can think about that as a zip code. Uh, to be able to, uh, to take that large picture and say, you know, what will happen in Oakland versus what will happen in South San Francisco. And that is really at the heart of being able to adapt to the specific conditions that, that you are, are going to be dealing with. And they're different in the mountains than they are in the Central Valley or in San Diego. So also, I, I want to emphasize that we see clean tech uh, as being a technological approach, not necessarily just things. Uh, it's also uh, the data analysis. It's also the, uh, the ability to predict in the future and derive products and take the private sector, uh, the private sector's uh, uh, capability uh, to use all of this information. Uh, another example, uh, human health impact. It's probably not something that you would associate with an oceanographic institution, but this is uh, one of the things that we're very uh, that we're working on uh, very closely because, as you all know, uh, it's not just the gradual incremental warming each year that's a danger for us in terms of human health. It's the heat waves that come, and uh, faculty that we have at Scripps who are partners with the uh, School of Medicine work on how exactly the, those heat waves promulgate into human health impacts. So if we understand that, we can develop both strategies and policies to be able to address it. The lower right uh, photograph there is an uh, infrared image of a schoolyard, a uh, school play yard, uh, on a hot day. And you can see the difference between the shade on the right, which is 90 degrees, and the, and the, the uh, paved surface of the schoolyard, which is 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So now think about the, fit, the water problems that we have and the fact that we've uh, torn up all the grass and, uh, uh, and are really struggling with how we manage that uh, for children. Think about the elderly, uh, many of whom in our area are not in air-conditioned uh, housing and who don't want to leave their safety to go to shelters during warm weather. So you can understand that the tools that you might develop uh, to be able to uh, measure that, to personalize the situation, or to inform policy would be extremely important. And they're part of clean tech as well. Um, the little video that you're seeing is the, um, uh, the temp between May and the end of July, the temperature records that were shattered around the, the world. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we, we've been working on with uh, the state and with local government is the California Heat Assessment Tool, which is designed to provide information about heat events that are most likely to affect the vulnerable. 
So developing these kinds of tools is another kind of technology for us to adapt uh, and to see the impacts. Um, sea level rise is also another element of, of this uh, whole climate change piece. Uh, this is actually an image uh, from a surge uh, who's going to be part of the panel here from Imperial Beach and shows uh, uh, an area that was flooded uh, during uh, a king tide uh, in the last uh, couple of years. So one of our big challenges is understanding uh, what we're going to have to adapt to in sea level rise. And this image shows on the left-hand side, the yellow uh, is the, the existing sea level rise, and then all of those are the models that are coming out. And the reason I put it here is to show you that we're really at a cusp uh, in our understanding of sea level to understand which path we're on. And of course, our, our mitigation actions uh, help to, to predict which path, which path we're on. But all of them uh, involve uh, substantial uh, changes that we're going to have to make in order to adapt our infrastructure and, uh, and even some of our strategies for cities and towns uh, in response to sea level rise. So we see our role not only as understanding, uh, helping to understand which of these paths we're going to be on, but also how specifically does this, tra this global curve translate to the local environment and how, what tools can we provide that allow people to understand exactly how to adapt in very specific areas. Uh, so this is uh, an example um, from Del Mar, just, uh, just uh, the, in the north county of San Diego. The, and this is the um, uh, annual uh, sea level from 2000 to, um, or, I'm sorry, it's month to month, uh, an average from 2000 to 2018. The blue is the normal tidal variation, so higher tides during the summer, uh, higher tides in, uh, in November. The red is the, uh, in, is the uh, water level due to sea level rise, and you can see that it's different at different times of the year, and it's because of the, the overall uh, impact of tides on sea level. And then the yellow is all storm surge. So that's the average that we have experienced. Um, this is what would happen to that with one foot of sea level rise. And so it's not so much the blue, which is the, the average, it's all of the, those uh, increases and the, the storm surge on top of that. And that's what you see with two feet or three feet. Uh, so sorting that, uh, the message is certainly we need to understand which path we're on. But the other is that we need to be sensitive to the fact that it's not just uh, an average across the entire year. And it's going to be different in Del Mar than it is in Imperial Beach or in San Francisco or Oakland. Uh, so we have a lot of tools for, uh, for understanding that. Uh, a primary one is understanding the, the, uh, uh, the waves and tides that are part of that storm surge. And this is a buoy on the left. Uh, we, we have a, we're, we're responsible for a buoy system actually across the entire country that is a wave and tide buoy uh, system that allows us to uh, to make very, very specific predictions. I'll give you another example. It's not, not directly uh, climate, but it gives you an example of how we use these. So the waves, wave and tide buoy that's outside of the Port of Los Angeles is used to understand what's coming in in terms of the big wave uh, swells. And it's so uh, expensive to dredge that the uh, Port of Los Angeles is dredged only three feet deeper than the deepest keel that goes through it. So a three-foot wave could ground a ship in the channel. 
So what this does, um, uh, what the, that prediction does, is allow Port of Los Angeles to either hurry uh, the big ships through or keep them waiting uh, and in order to uh, let the big wave systems come through. Uh, according to them, uh, this is routinely allowing them to bring in more of the largest ships without dredging the channel. So that's a technology. It's a way that something that is a basic uh, understanding of the ocean is used for economic benefit. And it's a, it's a product that is developed not by us, but by uh, a private company for the Port of Los Angeles to do this. So another example of that sort of, of uh, technology. Um, the, uh, this is uh, just some of the images from the uh, uh, year before last, the uh, El Nino year, when uh, we, had, we had, in addition to the, uh, the normal uh, uh, storm uh, for the winter, uh, we had El Nino. And most people don't realize that uh, El Nino piles up water on the eastern part of the Pacific, and so sea level actually rises during an El Nino year in California. In our area, it rises by almost 10 inches on average during an El Nino year compared to a non-El Nino year. So what does that give us? It gives us a fabulous model for what sea level is going to be like by 2030 to 2050 and how the storm surge will work. Um, another uh, example that I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about is uh, wildfire. And that's certainly something that California and all of the Southwest is experiencing uh, in increasing uh, amounts, not just because it's warmer, but because of the impact on that, on the, the fuel and on the, the dryness of that fuel. So uh, one of the things that, uh, this is a, a little example of how basic research gets used for purposes that we didn't anticipate. So we're also the Earth Science Department of UC San Diego, and we study big earthquakes. And one of the most dangerous segments of the San Andreas is the San Jacinto segment east of town, east of San Diego, because it hasn't had uh, a magnitude six or greater in over 300 years. And its re historical repeat is 100 years. So we're very focused on it. We have all kinds of instrumentation out next to the San Jacinto. Well, we want to be able to have that information immediately, especially if there, uh, if there were small earthquakes. So we developed a communication system um, to use microwave uh, uh, communication from the site uh, up to the nearest mountaintop, and then mountaintop to mountaintop back to scripts. So it was designed for this uh, scientific work. Uh, we put cameras on those mountaintops uh, to be able to be aware of whether there had been any uh, vandalism. In the 2003 fires, uh, we saw that you could see the direction of the fire and what was happening with it as a result of those cameras. And we brought in CAL FIRE and they used that system to be able to direct their resources. Uh, since then, we have developed that partnership with CAL FIRE, and now we have cameras that are not only can pan around, but they can also tilt and zoom, and we've made them uh, uh, so that they can be directed by CAL FIRE, Cal Fire independently. So now CAL FIRE routinely uses the cameras and the microwave communication system uh, to fight fires in, in, uh, uh, in San Diego County. And we are now partnering with Sonoma to put this system in place uh, in Sonoma and the uh, uh, Division of Natural uh, Resources of uh, California is talking to us about how they can extend the system to the entire state. It's called Alert Wildfire, something that you wouldn't uh, anticipate coming out of our work on seismology. But again, the development of tools 
that allow CAL FIRE to do that and to use that data, those are tools that are opportunities for new technology. Uh, this is uh, the, the uh, chief for CAL FIRE and the county fire authority um, talking about the fact that we're having fires year-round, uh, even in January and February. And this is a, uh, a model of the increase uh, in the average burned by wildfires uh, with increasing temperature. Um, so this is uh, the 60s through the 90s. This is what's predicted for 2030s to 2060s and the end of the century. Uh, and that's a business as usual case. So uh, in the same way that we worry about, about heat itself, about human impacts, about agricultural impacts, the fire impacts are extraordinary. Uh, so the, and there's uh, just some examples of the images that are being used by CAL FIRE uh, and uh, uh, you know, responding to this. Uh, one last uh, example, uh, and that's atmospheric rivers. So everybody in California knows what atmospheric rivers are now. Uh, and there's an image of, this is the integrated water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, obviously there's a lot in the tropics where there's a lot of evaporation. But the atmospheric rivers are these long, linear feature, river-like features that come up out of the tropics. And when they encounter land, dump a lot of water. So the questions are, you know, is it going to hit me? When? And how much water is it going to bring? And those are questions not only for us as individuals, but also for water managers. Uh, here's a little uh, video of one of those moving up. And so the, the gr uh, green and yellow is water that's precipitated, so not just water that's in the atmosphere, but the atmospheric river carrying that directly from the tropics to California. Uh, so improving our forecasting ability is really key, not just for the safety of dams, like the Oroville uh, on the, the right-hand side, but also for the management of them. Right now, uh, uh, dams and reservoirs in, uh, in California are required by law to release about half of the water in them at the beginning of the rainy season, mm -hmm. if there is a rainy season. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's because uh, an atmospheric river can bring enough water to essentially fill and overflow uh, the reservoir in a very short time. And of course, that's what was happening at, at Oroville. And you don't want to be releasing that water at the same time that it's raining like crazy, because now you've doubled your flood. Uh, possibility. So uh, that's why we lower, uh, lower the res reservoirs. But in, in uh, years where we don't have that much rain in the, the basin for that particular reservoir, uh, we lose all of that water. And an estimate of the financial loss to California each year from releasing the water is $350 million in water that's being released every year to tide. Uh, because we can't predict these. So what we're doing is focusing very, very specifically on prediction at the three to five day uh, uh, time range, which is exactly what's needed. And the Army Corps of Engineers has agreed that if we can demonstrate that predictability, they will change the reservoir management uh, tool for California. So that's an example now of uh, the, the climate change uh, and what it's doing, the, the basic research, the way that we're connecting directly with uh, decision makers and decision support to try to address this problem. Uh, but that's an example of uh, uh, a reservoir near Stockton, California, uh, before an atmospheric river and, and during the uh, 2014 drought and then 2017. Uh, during a uh, heavy atmospheric river, uh, just night and day. And it shows you how quickly these things can fill. So our science has moved from the general and the theoretical to the specific and how we can do the science that's necessary
or decision making. And the key between the decision making and the science is the opportunity. The opportunity for technologies of all sorts related to our response to this incredible issue of climate change. Thanks very much. As part of the uh, email announcement on the event, you received all the bios for all the speakers, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading those. I'll just highlight some nuggets of information about each of them that I think is important. Uh, so let me do that now. Let me bring everyone up, and let me first introduce and bring up uh, our own assembly member from the 78th district in, in California, which represents all of us in San Diego. In fact, every single one of these panelists is a constituent of his. Uh, but Todd Gloria, assembly member Todd Gloria, has joined us today. Um, as many of you know, and maybe you don't know, uh, Todd was one of the co-authors of the recently signed Senate Bill 100. Um, we actually had an interesting time in San Diego's history. Yes, right there. Uh, <laughs> we had an interesting time in San Diego's history where we had an interim mayor, uh, which is we called it the I mayor, uh, which that was Todd. Um, and at that time, uh, our I mayor uh, was really instrumental in drafting a pretty aggressive uh, and progressive climate action plan for the city of San Diego. Um, that was really spearheaded by Todd at that time, was eventually passed by a Republican mayor and is now being implemented by a Republican mayor. Um, and Cody Kuba, <coughs> Chief Sustainability Officer with the city of San Diego, is now responsible for making that happen. Um, but really the seed was planted in San Diego uh, because of the work that Todd uh, was doing as, while he was uh, filling a void in San Diego as our interim mayor at the time. So Todd, thank you for being here today. Since 1980, uh, Mayor Dedina has been uh, dedicating most of his time to protecting the coastal wildlands of California. Uh, he has successfully worked with fishing communities and grassroots organizations on both sides of the border to preserve more than 3 million acres of globally significant coastal and marine habitats. Under his leadership, a clean water coalition was recently formed uh, to force the federal government to stop the millions of gallons of sewage that is being spilled into uh, the, the ocean uh, out of Tijuana and the San Diego border. Uh, and in March, a lawsuit was actually filed against the IBWC, the International Boundary of Water Commission, uh, for what could be the, the worst clean water violation um, in U.S. history, and all of that's being really led by uh, Surge. Uh, so please help me welcome Mayor Hedin. Well, moving, moving north in San Diego, uh, Solana Beach, uh, is another uh, another community that's doing some really aggressive uh, and progressive things for our region. Um, and that's really being led by Council Member Peter Zahn uh, from the city of Solana Beach. Peter, please join us up here. Thank you. Um, I think Peter's on his second round of serving as a council member in, in Solana Beach. Uh, but during his first tenure there, uh, he was really active in a number of issues before the city and really helped lay the groundwork. Uh, for the adoption of the city's community choice aggregation program, which was launched earlier this year, uh, which is setting a goal of 100% renewable energy for its its city. Um, and Peter's work has led others, including Todd and Cody, uh, to, to replicate what's happening in, in Solana Beach on a broader level. Uh, Peter is also a nationally respected environmental leader. Uh, he's led efforts to show how even a small city like Solana Beach can play uh, a role in this global change or global climate change um, conversation. Uh, he's, he's in Paris as part of COP um, and outside of, uh, of politics, Peter supports entrepreneurship and social innovation through programs such as the Zahn Innovation Platform at San Diego State University uh, and the Global Social Innovation Challenge at the University of San Diego. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. Now I'd like to bring up Cody Hooven, the Chief Sustainability Officer, I think the first Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of San Diego, um, and probably what will be the best Sustainability okay. Officer. For the city. <laughs> of um, so Cody has a pretty easy job. Uh, she is responsible for uh, implementing the City of San Diego's Climate Action Plan. Uh, when it was passed, again, thanks to Todd's work, uh, it was seen as one of the most aggressive uh, and ambitious climate action plans in the country. Um, and Cody's job on a day-to-day -day basis is making sure it becomes a reality. Um, Cody is widely regarded as a regional expert uh, when it comes to the adoption and implementation of a climate action plan. Um, is a highly sought-after speaker on the topic. She's really known locally and I think beyond uh, as being fair and balanced and really trying to make sure that everyone's interests are met as the city moves forward with its plan. So Cody, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, now uh, I'd like to 
introduce our, our local Kiwi, uh, <laughs> Nicola Hedge, the Director of Environment Initiatives for the San Diego Foundation. Nicola, you're welcome to join us. Um, through Nicola's work at the foundation, uh, local governments are receiving the necessary assistance, money, uh, to develop and adopt climate action plans. Um, since 2006, the foundation has invested more than three and a half million dollars in local efforts to catalyze greater regional action to reduce polluting emissions, facilitate and strengthen collaborative efforts to prepare for climate change, and build public awareness and engage regional leaders around local solutions to climate change. Um, the foundation has actually sponsored um, and authored reports such as San Diego 2050 is Calling, How Will You Answer? and San Diego's Changing Climate, a regional wake-up call. So Cody has been instrumental in really changing um, and advancing the dialogue, I'm sorry, Nicola, around climate change. <laughs> it's really Cody. <laughs>